these verses shall serve to set out the beginning of what I am calling this morning a series of lessons on the word of reconciliation. We're going to emphasize that man and God cooperate together as to the ultimate end being man's forgiveness of sins, man's salvation. I'm going to emphasize verse 8 that we just read. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. I mentioned that this is the first in a series of lessons that's designed to help people understand what Paul is talking about when he wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The American Standard 1901 says, handling aright the word of truth. Obviously, there is, according to God, a right way to handle the word of truth, which implies there's a wrong way to handle it. Now, we don't want to be found handling it the wrong way because we will not learn the way of salvation. We will not learn about God's part in our salvation and we will not learn our part in our salvation. So this is a very significant verse regarding the importance of studying the Bible, our obligation to study it, and that there is a right way to handle it if we're going to get out of it, only what God put into it, that we might be saved from our sins. So for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Man was lost. <clears throat> God graciously purposed to save him. All antecedent dispensations were only preparatory to that perfected system that is by grace, grace meaning favor, in this case God's favor, by grace or by God's favor through, that's a preposition, through this avenue of faith. You'll remember from your study of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. He grew to manhood. And when about 30 years of age, he entered into his public ministry. He went about, according to the scriptures, doing good. And by his miracles, he demonstrated that he was God in the flesh that he was deity, divine, and that God was with him. Let me pause here and emphasize when we say miracle, we're not talking about miracle drugs as we use the term today. But we mean works that Jesus did that was beyond human power and natural law to do. Thus he proved that he was a son of God, John 20, 30, and 31. Now, early on in his ministry, he made choice of 12 disciples to be his apostles. The word apostles means one chosen and sent out on a particular journey for a particular purpose. And to them he revealed himself and made known the mysteries. Mystery in the Bible means that which is unrevealed. The mysteries of the kingdom. We know from the scriptures that he died, that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day. Now, to his apostles, the scripture says, to his apostles he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, and note the word proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, 
It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in His own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So Luke wrote in Acts chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Thus from the presence of his chosen ambassadors. Now focus on that word ambassador. It's the first time we've used it. He was taken up into heaven and made both Lord and Christ as Peter and the other apostles declared him to be in Acts chapter 2. Now let me mention this about the word ambassador. Most of the time we use the word apostles of Christ. We explain the difference in a disciple who's a follower or learner of Christ and the meaning of the word apostle, one chosen out of the disciples to fulfill a specific purpose and to do a certain job. Well, that certain job was to be ambassadors of the court of heaven. Jesus would not be on this earth after his ascension anymore. But the New Testament of the Christ had not yet been revealed and fully revealed and written down. It was through the apostles, the ambassadors of the court of heaven, that our Lord did this. Now, let's understand that an ambassador from the government of the United States to some other government is an official person. Sometimes we say of Americans who travel abroad that we are ambassadors of goodwill. Well, that's fine. We're, in other words, we're to act like Americans. I might say whatever that means anymore, but I mean it in a good sense. But when you talk about the ambassadors of the United States to the different governments or countries, you're talking about somebody that represents exactly the official position of the government of the United States, and he only has those credentials and is empowered so to act. That's called plenty potentiary power. That's what every ambassador has, plenty potentiary power. When he speaks in his ambassadorial position, he speaks the position of the government of the United States to any other government. When the apostles of Jesus Christ, being the ambassadors of the court of heaven, when they spake, they spake the will of the king on earth. Now you can see this in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. Because Luke records of the early church, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. What does that mean? Well, the teaching of the apostles. But why? Because they were ambassadors of the court of heaven. What does that mean? When they spake as the Holy Spirit gave them the will of Christ to speak, the early church knew that. Knowing that Christ sits and rules in heaven, how are they to know His will on earth now that He's gone back to heaven? Because He chose these ambassadors, these apostles of Christ. And by their baptismal, uh, by being baptized in the Holy Spirit, they were empowered then to speak as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. Well, what did they speak? Well, let me suggest that you read John chapters 14, 15, and 16 concerning the work of the Holy Spirit with the apostles to enable them to exercise and have this plenipotentiary power that all ambassadors have so they would speak exactly the will of the King Jesus Christ. And that's what we have in the perfect law of liberty, James calls it, James 1.25, the New Testament of Jesus Christ. So on the first Pentecost, after these things had occurred, the Holy Spirit came and He qualified the apostles the chosen ambassadors of Christ, who at once began to make known the word of reconciliation, making it known to a lost world, lost in sin. Romans 3.23 says plainly, all of sin and come short of the glory of God. Sin, according to the Bible, is the transgression of God's law, 1 John 3.4. 
And the wages of sin and death is death, Romans 6.23. And so they began to make known the word of reconciliation. Man separated himself from God by sin. He needs to be reconciled. It's by the word of truth that man learns the process whereby he can be reconciled to God as if he had never sinned. So the world is ruined by sin. It permeates the world. All have sinned, as we've noticed. Now, to ascertain what that word of reconciliation is, how it's understood, and how it's applied in this series of sermons, then we want to begin this study and continue with it for some time. Now, there's a need to answer certain questions to lay the groundwork. And to have the wherewithal, because remember, we're wanting to handle the Word of God in a right manner. Remember, we're commanded in the study of the Bible that it's our responsibility to handle it rightly. We're studying it to learn how to be saved. We're studying it to learn our duty to God. We're studying it to learn how that our salvation is a cooperative effort. It doesn't just involve God without man. And it doesn't just involve man without God. Salvation then from sin is the result of the cooperation of human and divine agencies. And without this cooperation, listen, no soul will be saved from sin. Now, this truth is taught by many, many scriptures. And by none more clearly... When correctly interpreted than the passage that we started out with. For by grace are you saved through faith. When we say by grace, we're talking about God's part in our salvation. The divine side of our salvation or part in our salvation. When we see the inspired writer Paul saying through faith, then we're talking about the human side of salvation. The human part. Whatever is and was necessary to devise, to perfect this plan, and to apply a plan of salvation that is by God adapted to man's needs is involved in the expression by grace. All that is required in order that man may appropriate and enjoy the salvation provided by the expression through faith. Now there's a similarity between God's works in the natural and spiritual realms. I say the natural and spiritual realms. God perpetuates natural life. But he does not do so, as far as we humans are concerned, without human cooperation. He gives the food element. Man must do what's necessary to have the food, to prepare it, and to feed upon it. He gives us air. It's free. It's by God's favor. But man must do what's necessary to take it into his lungs. He gives us water. As far as I know, as far as the water's concerned, the air and the food, man couldn't make any of that possible. But through natural law and the way things work, when it comes to the water... Just like the air, he takes it in, he drinks it, he benefits from it. So it is in the matter of salvation from sins. God provides the means. Man appropriates the means. He prepares the way. Man walks in the way. Until it can be demonstrated that one can have physical life without physical sustenance such as food, air, and water. No one should hope or expect for spiritual life without the divine part having to do with our salvation from sin. In like manner, until these natural elements of themselves, of themselves, will produce long life, none should expect spiritual life without the effort on his or her part to walk 
in the divine way. The salvation that is in Christ, and that's where salvation is located, Galatians 3 and verse 27, in Christ. That salvation, I say, is taught in types and shadows, even in the Old Testament. All these teach divine and human cooperation. Time in this one sermon won't let us go into all of these, but we hope, God willing, to develop some of this and pursue it more in depth in several sermons to come. We want to look at one right now. The children of Israel, you know, were in bondage in Egypt. They were slaves in Egypt. Many and grievous burdens. By the Egyptians was placed upon them because they were slaves. God heard their cry of misery and for deliverance. He saw their affliction. He knew their sorrow. And He determined to deliver them. Exodus chapter 3 and verse number 7. Now to do this, He sent Moses to lead them out of bondage in Egypt. And this man he endowed with all power necessary to prove that what he was saying to Pharaoh was from God and not from man. That is, if Pharaoh had been honest and recognized the plagues that Moses and Aaron worked, then he would realize, I'll cooperate with God about these people, but he would not. And we see then that this man would not, by the power he had, allow them to leave Egypt. He rejected those things. Now under this divinely called and divinely qualified leader, Moses, they were ultimately and finally able to, as the scripture says, they forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. Marching, by the way, not not the near route headed for the land of Canaan, which would have been by the way of the Philistines. But they went by a circuitous route, by the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. Now they at last in their journeys, as they begin this long journey, camped on the west shore of that sea. On their right was an impassable mountain. On their left... There was a tongue of the sea. And in their front was the main body of water of the sea. Best we know, some eight or ten miles wide. Now what was in their rear? Well, it was a broad valley through which they had come. Pharaoh, regretting his action and letting them go, having pursued them with a great army, was pressing upon them through that valley. I pause here to bring this out about what was announced here in the last week or so. It remains to be seen where it's totally verified to be that. But archaeologists just of late have found just in recent months a great army and all of its battle accoutrements drowned in the Dead Sea. Bones filed upon bones. They estimate as many as 40,000. You can put that together whatever you want to, but it didn't just happen by accident. Seeing nothing but disaster awaiting them, the people in their weakness of faith, in their terror, because they knew what Pharaoh and his armies could do, chided Moses for having led them into the wilderness to perish. But now notice what Moses said to them. Fear ye not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Now listen to what he said. Which he will show you today for the Egyptians whom ye have seen today. Ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you and ye shall hold your peace. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore Christ thou unto me, Speak unto the children of Israel, 
that they go forward. Exodus 14, verses 13 through 15. Now you keep that in mind. That they go forward. In obedience to God's command, Moses stretched his rod out over the sea. And you'll remember that the divine volume says that the Lord caused the sea to go back by an east wind and made the sea dry land. Thus, a way of escape was provided which man by his own ingenuity and, ingenuity and power could not foresee nor accomplish. What they could not do, this is significant, the Lord did for them. What they could not do, or what they could do, what they could do, the Lord required them to do it. Hence the command, go forward. Now if God ever gave a non-essential command, this was not one. Disobedience here meant capture and return to bondage. Obedience meant safety and freedom from oppression. Scripture says they did not halt between two opinions to use a term in the Bible. They knew. You know, somebody says, how long do you have to deliberate when your coattail's on fire? So they could read the signs rather quickly. They obeyed it once. And passing between the congealed walls of sea, they reached the opposite side as they passed between them and as Paul said, in the mist and the cloud and the sea. The Egyptians tried to do that. They, they tried to follow them. But divine power didn't intervene on their behalf. And we know that they were destroyed in the midst of the sea. Well now, the Israelites were not saved as a result of the divine work or the human work alone. But from a proper combination of both. God could as easily have carried this mighty host bodily over the sea as to open up this channel the way he did. But by doing so, he would have set aside human agency. A man has a free will. He must be able to choose which way he will go. God wants people to serve him who want to serve him and choose to serve him and will divest themselves of anything that's contrary to the Lord's will. So in working with man on earth, there must be a system whereby we're saved that allows us to choose between God and Satan, between obedience and disobedience. And Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 1, writing the church in Corinth, makes this typical of man's deliverance from sin saying that they were all baptized into Moses and cloud in the sea. Moses is a type of Christ. And they're passing through the sea, baptized in the cloud and in the sea, a type of the baptism, as Peter declared in 1 Peter 3.21, that doth also now save us. But notice, preceding being baptized, they had to turn away from a life of bondage in Egypt and follow. That didn't mean you could say, well, I'm sorry for my sins, but I think I'll remain a, save, be a slave and be saved too. It was impossible. Type and anti-type always agree. Hence, as there were both divine and human parts in the type, so there must be in the anti-type the salvation of sinners. The scheme of human redemption had its power in God's love for man. And divine power was brought to bear in perfecting that marvelous scheme of redemption. One poet has said, Grace first contrived the way to save a rebellious man. And all the steps that grace displayed, which drew the wondrous plan. But that plan is put into effect by a humble heart that receives with meekness the engrafted word, turning from the practiced life of sin to serve God. The grace of God sent Jesus to be the great sin offering in the world. Man couldn't do that. But God could, living as man and being a man. Tentative in every point like as we are, yet without sin. And as John saw Jesus coming to his baptism, said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. John 3.16 we know well, but most people can quote it. I don't think they understand it at all. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son 
that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You can see the great motivating power behind the divine side of things, the love of God. You see the gift, Jesus Christ, and that gift was given to man. But then you see not only the divine side, but the human side must receive on the basis of belief and obedience what God has ordained to save him and that God's done for him that he couldn't do for himself. This grace sent the Holy Spirit to be the great revealer of this scheme in the Bible. To convince the world of sin and righteousness and judgment, John 16, 8. That favor or grace provided a church or kingdom, the body of Christ, the family of God, in which is forgiveness, outside of which is no forgiveness. Redemption then through the blood of Christ shed on Calvary's cross from the sinless Christ for the remission of our sins. Colossians 1, 13 and 14. And in which man can be trained, that is in the church, and disciplined for a heavenly state. And that's what we're doing in living the Christian life. We're forming a character that will fit heaven. Which character we shall take with us when we shuffle off this mortal coil and enter into eternity. Finally, this grace gives us the gospel of the grace of God, which Paul tells us is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, Romans 1.16. That's why Jesus said in the Great Commission, as Mark records it, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Where the word of God or the gospel has not gone, there are no Christians. Because the gospel is God's power to save. Read as Paul rehearses what he preached to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, as to the gospel preached. In the death and the burial and resurrection of Christ. All that God did for man he never could do for himself. And yet he has said you must receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. The gospels preached to men and in their understanding as God's made them to intellectually comprehend. They understand the words of truth. Not only understanding what God did for them but what they must do to appropriate the blessing that God did for them that they never could do for themselves. There is often much anxiety about the divine part in salvation. I've never found it to be so with me. I've always thought God would do just what God's going to do and God has done what He's done. I've been greatly concerned about my responsibility to be faithful to Him and compliant with His will. So we should not be anxious about the divine part in salvation. What was necessary for God to do has been done. Whatever is necessary for him to do, he will do at the proper time. The thing for man to do is to study very carefully and honestly God's will to learn his part. Our responsibility to God. How we appropriate all the great blessings God did for us we couldn't do for ourselves. And then with all the power within us, laying aside the sin that does so easily beset us. Let us then faithfully and earnestly do our part in repenting of our sins, turning from whatever acts or conditions we're in. That's what repentance means, you know, as we studied last week. That means we leave undone things we've been doing that was wrong, and we take upon ourselves things the Word of God says is our responsibility. And the rest of our life we'll live. Whatever we must sacrifice in order to enjoy what God's done for us, we never, never could do for ourselves. All will be well with us then in recognizing God's part in our salvation and our part in our salvation. What the human part is will be developed in subsequent sermons in this series. But I hope this has laid the groundwork to understand that anybody is going to understand how God saves man from his sins. It will be when they understand how to rightly divide the word of truth, which is a must, it's obligatory, it's imperative, 2 Timothy 2.15. And when they realize to begin with that man's salvation from sin doesn't just involve God, man's left out, or it doesn't just involve man and God's left out. It is a cooperative effort. Each of us doing what we should. God's done his part. And that always involved him doing for us what we never could do for ourselves. Our responsibility is to understand the truth by study, 
and be willing to divest ourselves of evil and embrace the truth and belief and obedience. Thus, if you're not a Christian today, you must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But it's not just belief only. You must then repent of your sins, turning from the sins in your life that are contrary to God's will, Acts 17.30. Confessing your faith in the Christ, then you're qualified to be baptized for the remission of sins and to become a Christian. If you're not going to hear the word, if you're not going to believe once you've heard it, if you're not going to repent of your sins having heard and believed, if you're not going to confess your faith in Christ, then you're not a qualified person to be baptized for the remission of sins. As a child of God, if you've wandered from the truth, if you've committed one or a multiplicity of sins, or if you've just departed completely from the whole New Testament system, there is a second law of pardon. It's repentance of sin or sins. Confession of those sins and praying God's forgiveness. We always offer this invitation. We offer it now. To anyone who needs to be on God's side, we invite you then to respond to the truth while we stand and sing. <laughs>